Well, Taylor, you're one of the Mariners I was really looking forward to talking to. When you came up, it was kind of a chaotic time of year last year, mm -hmm. and uh, not a lot of opportunity. And you go on the internet, not a lot about you there, but you come from an interesting part of the country. Yes, ma'am. You went to a very good school. Yep. And I'm thinking there's a lot going on here. Yeah. Let's start where you were born and raised in Baton Rouge? Yes, ma'am. Born and raised in Baton Rouge. Uh, I live about 30 minutes north of Baton Rouge now. A little okay. small town um, called Ethel. Uh, about 3,000 people. Um, no red lights. So it's got one red light actually. It's a it's a it's the uh, the blinking one. I don't uh, I don't really know what that one's called, but yeah. Do you small obey town. it? Uh, yeah, the stop sign, so you have to obey. Don't it. know so, what it uh, is, but it's yeah, there. There's one red light, and that's that's really about it. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, so live there now, and that's about it. What about where you grew up? What was it like? Uh, if I were to, if you were to drop me in your hometown on a summer day, what would it be? What would I see? Hmm. Now, a lot, a lot more people than what it was uh, several years ago. When I graduated, I graduated with a class of about, I think, 300, 350. Now, I don't even think they're letting kids in at the high school because there's so many. It's, it's basically a smaller Baton Rouge. So Zachary, where I went to high school, is about 25 minutes from Baton Rouge. Um, and when I was growing up, there wasn't a lot of things around. There wasn't a Raising Canes that just got put in. Several, a couple years back, um, so it's it's definitely getting bigger and bigger and bigger as as the days go by. Whereas when I was there, it was kind of a small town, and by small I mean there's still thousands of people there, but um, it's pretty big now. So I guess if I was to drop you in Zachary when I grew up, or when I was there, it would, I'd say uh, um, I don't know, very small, uh, not a lot of people, not much to do. Uh, we'd hunt, fish, um, during high school we'd have high school parties, stuff like that, but there wasn't much to do. <laughs> so if you look at the map, it looks like it's on the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's close. Um, so Baton Rouge, if, if you're coming from, um, from my house, that the Mississippi River would be on my right, so, um, yeah, so we're close to Mississippi, um, really close actually. Um, trying to think I don't really go fishing on the Mississippi you don't no okay. um, was it a summer so I, I, I grew up not too far up on the other end of the Mississippi okay it's kind of a summer spot it's yeah kind of uh, spot. I've went I don't know if it was legal or illegal but I went there one time with my buddy we went we rode our trucks underneath the uh, which is now the uh, St. Francisville bridge okay. whenever we were growing up in high school or when I was in high school the bridge was slowly getting to being built Mm -hmm. um, before that, you had to cross a, a ferry to get to the other side of the river if you wanted to go to our camp. Um, but now they have a bridge. So at the time, whenever we were growing up, we, uh, like I said, I don't know if it was legal or illegal. It could have been <laughs> illegal, which it probably was. We, uh, we it's drove our trucks. Town. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> we drove our trucks underneath it, and um, they had like some rocks and stuff. And I remember we fished a little bit, mm -hmm. but obviously with the Mississippi, it's kind of hard to fish that river since the current's so right. strong and everything's just going fast, fast, fast. Um, so yeah, that's probably the only time I've ever been on the Mississippi as far as fishing or riding boats and stuff. Um, mainly we would go to our camps. A lot of my buddies have camps. I have a camp on Old River, which is probably, I don't know, 45 minutes from Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. give or take. Um, so yeah, we would go there and do our fishing and hang out there and kind of get away. What is a camp? That's not something we have up in uh, Seattle. That's so fine. camps, <laughs> I guess for us, it's a place for a hunt and lodge or okay. I guess they call it, I don't know what they call them in Seattle, but it's like uh, a cabin yeah, like a cabin, like a cabin in the woods. You'd go hang out okay. the cabin in the woods. So for us, it'd be a camp, a hunting camp, fishing uh -huh. camp. Um, so that's our our fishing camps in Old River. Um, it's a single wide, I believe, or double wide trailer. It's jacked up about I don't know 30 feet in the air, uh -huh. um, and that's where we'd go and hang out and go fishing um, and kind of get away. I knew Enjoy there was a spot. So that's the spot. That's, that's the spot, yeah. Palm, kind of maybe that's the and now it's, it's hard now being with ball and stuff, mm -hmm. you know. But during high school, we'd have summers off to an extent. We still had travel ball tournaments and stuff. But I went there a lot more when I was in high school and, you know, in college. And I came home during the during the off season or during fall or whatever and had some time. I was able to go um, more. But now it's kind of hard being with balls so much longer. And then summertime is just the time no to go. Summers. No summer, so yeah, now it's very rare that I get up there. I'd like to get up there more, but it's kind of hard. 
spend your off seasons there? Yes, ma'am. I would love to. I would love to spend my off seasons at the camp if I could. <laughs> but I have a house now, so I enjoy my house now you out live in the middle. In an actual house yes, ma'am. I, I, I bought my I bought my own house this off season. Um, it's about five minutes from my parents' house in a little small in our small town called Ethel. Um, got my own land, so. That had to feel good to be able to go I, out and do that. I loved it. I, Did that you was the best out thing. The spot before, no, no, ma'am, not really. I uh, I was looking in the area um, between Ethel, Slaughter, uh, Zachary a little bit. The property taxes in Zachary are pretty expensive now, just because of the school and the, mm -hmm. everything's on its own over there. Um, so I was looking all in that area. I wanted to get out of the city. I don't like being in cities. I, I hate I hate cities. Um, so I ended up finding this house and. It was a little bit, at first I thought it was a little bit out of my price range, but I kind of figured out how much it would cost me a month and I was like, okay, that, I can handle that. And it's three bed, two bath, um, got four, four and a quarter of an acre. Mm -hmm. It's got pine trees in the back, so it's mm. a nice little peaceful getaway. I don't have any, nobody running up and down the roads nonstop. Everybody knows everybody where I'm from, especially on that road, so it's nice, I enjoy it. What was it like signing the papers? Uh, kind of hard to swallow seeing that much money that I got to pay somebody <laughs> for a house but um no it's it's good I it wasn't it was a good timing or it was great to sign it but then at the same time knowing how much I have to pay for it it was like man I got a long time to pay this thing <laughs> off so thank god I signed it for that 30 years I think it was but um no it was definitely great to be able to actually buy my own house and be on my own Awesome, that's a big milestone. Yes, right huge, huge. Absolutely. Big family or little family? Um, I would say we have a big family. Um, I have three sets of grandparents, um, mom and dad. So we're all very, very close-knit. I live five minutes from my parents' house. Or actually, probably like three minutes from my parents' house. Um, from one set of my grandparents, I live 10 minutes. Another one, I think 15 minutes. So anything that ever happens, they're right there. They take care of my house while I'm gone. Mm -hmm. So it's nice being close to them. So I would say we have a, our immediate family's pretty big. Um, we do everything together, hang out all the time, go to each other's houses, cook, hang out. So I enjoy that, it's nice. What's a gathering like, what, what's cooked? Ooh, uh, before I leave for spring training, we do at least two or three times of crawfish boils, mm. um, which, I'm missing that now, um, but man, my, my grandfather, he cooks a lot. I learned from him. My dad cooks a lot as well, so I kind of learned from them how to cook, and that's one of my big things I love doing as well, so they kind of handed that down to me, but any, it's whatever my grandfather cooks. He texts us, hey, we're cooking this. If you want to come over and eat, you go over and eat. If not, you kind of fend for yourself, but that's kind of where we, we always go eat, so it's... Yeah. It's always something random. It could be fried fish, crawfish etouffee, jambalaya, um, really anything. It's nothing out of What's the your ordinary. Uh, I really like cooking gumbo, just because I like the process of cooking. I like you know taking my time. Um, I like enjoying adult beverage while I'm cooking. Mm -hmm. So. You know, take a beer, drink a beer while you're cooking in it. Gumbo. You're in the gumbo I don't do that. No? Okay. Gumbo, gumbo takes, I would say, a couple hours, four or five hours. Okay. So I enjoy that. I enjoy the time of cooking. I enjoy prepping everything and kind of making it a full day, whereas, you know, some meals take, you know, five or ten minutes. You like tacos, you can cook those in a minute or two. But I love tacos as well, but I, I enjoy just the <laughs> full preparation of cooking and how long it takes to do everything. So that's kind of one of my things I like doing, but none of my, I don't really have a specialty, I guess Louisiana food you could say, which is. Did Austin tell you about his gumbo, the first attempt at it down here? No, I would, I don't even want to know how that goes because the seasonings and stuff down here are probably not near, I know they're not as near as good as Louisiana's. So I can only imagine what he had to uh, mix his gumbo with over here compared to what he could have back home to mix it with. He actually struggled with the utensils. He didn't have a wooden spoon. You don't need a wooden spoon. Well, well, he did because he ended up melting the spatula in the <laughs> So he had a plastic spoon, okay. <laughs> plastic well, I say, you can use a metal spoon, <laughs> not in plastic. 
so he probably awesome. left it in there too long and then he forgot about it and he ended up melting the spoon that's on him that's so we're not even talking seasonings oh, okay. with him he's not up to seasonings that, that's, yet if he's yeah if he's melting spoons if he's melting spoons he's leaving the gumbo unattended for a couple hours so that's on him that ain't the spoon's fault and you did not hear any of that from me i'm gonna have to ask him about this one that's funny um i've never had that happen to me no, no i can't say you've got it a little bit more together yep How'd you come into baseball? Um, I've been playing for, I think everybody says four or five, so I'd probably say around there. Um, I think my aunt was the first one to buy me one of the little, uh, I forget the name, little tykes, I think, little mm -hmm. pop-up. Mm -hmm. Where you stop on Yeah, the ball. and the ball hits up or you put it on the tee with the big orange bat, right. which I'm pretty sure every kid had that. Um, so I think she's actually the one that first bought me that. And since then, I've been playing um, my whole life. Um, played normal other sports, you know, basketball, football, until I realized I was too skinny and lanky and tall to be playing football <laughs> versus those big old dudes you play against. So yeah, that was, good. no, that was done. That was done early. So I, I played baseball my whole life and still am. It's an honor. I have an idea that maybe I can do this professionally. Maybe this is it. Um, High school, I did well, um, and then when I started getting looked at kind of all over in Louisiana, um, I knew I wanted to play professional baseball, which I, I feel like a lot of people say that, mm -hmm. but knowing what I know now, it's a grind. It's it's hard to getting from A to, or from, you know, short season, getting drafted and banked to the big leagues is very, very hard, um, and I had a long road but I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, so I knew I always wanted to play it, but I never kind of knew what it would take to get to this level I'm at now. Um, but I got offered out of high school to go play at the University of Alabama and I enjoyed my four years there. Um, and then after that, I went to pro ball and it was a long four or five years. It's, it's brutal. People think, uh, people on the outside think it's a whole different story than what we're actually going through day in and day out on the minor league side, so. Did you ever question that you would get here? Um, yes and no. Um, I, th I think a lot of people question it solely because in my situation, I, I, I got very, very lucky to be in the shoes I'm in now, or the spot I'm in now, solely because I got traded. Um, so a lot of guys, I think, just in general in the minor leagues don't look at it as, they look at it as I gotta make it up with this team. So that was my whole thing. I was like, I got to make it up with the Nationals. I want to make it up with the Nationals. And I try to, I always thought about it that way. It's like, I need to make it up with them. Whereas in reality, you're playing for every other team. And, you know, after I went to the Fall League in 2018, had a really good Fall League. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to get protected by the Nationals. Didn't end up getting protected. So that kind of, I wouldn't say hurt me. I was, I was kind of upset because I had a really good Fall League. Started throwing really hard. And after that, I was like, you know, it is what it is. So kind of after, after that didn't happen, I just kind of started playing baseball with the, you know, screw it mindset. And after I kind of said screw it on so many other levels of everything, I just kind of let everything go. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to give it another year or two. And if I, if I play seven years and I don't make it, then I can at least say I gave it everything I got. And then it just so happened that last July, I believe, trade deadline, I want to say it was approaching, and I ended up getting traded, and here I am now. Do you still go with a screw it attitude, or now yes. you? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, you can ask You can ask our pitching <laughs> coach now, Woodworth, about my screw it attitude. <laughs> Can't say other words. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the mindset I've always had um, after that all happened. It's just like, I'm playing a game, I'm playing a kid's game. Can't Can't beat myself up about it too much, you know. So I kind of play and obviously you want to do good you want to succeed for your team and you want to be a, a a great ball player but you know you're gonna have your days where you don't have anything going for you and those are the days where kind of you, you beat yourself up about it but at the end of the day you got to remember you're playing a child's game mm -hmm. and you're making a lot of money doing it go get them the next day exactly there's always another day looking ahead to your season right now um what is going on over there? There's Sam Tuivailoa running. Yeah, running. <laughs> A little distracting. 
Uh, looking ahead to this season, when they uh, came up with a rule of three batter minimum, mm -hmm. that seems to play into what you do because you can get lefties and yeah. righties. Um, you know, coming into camp, we actually did in the minor leagues last year, and it never, it never really affected me or really anybody um, throughout throughout the games we played. Um, so, I guess they want to speed the game up, but I don't really think it speeds the game up to an extent. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're, you're, it's going to change. It's going to speed it up a little bit. If, you know, if a guy comes in and faces one batter, then he doesn't get the batter out. Then you know you got to put it in, get another guy. Um, but it doesn't really affect me. I, I've sat down with Skip and kind of asked him about it, like what he thought, and I, I knew ahead of time that it wouldn't affect me. And he said the same exact thing that I was thinking. Um, I get righties out just as good as lefties. Mm -hmm. um, I got a new pitch. I learned a slider, which is what they wanted me to come into spring training with. Okay. And that kind of opened up a whole another door. So now I have three pitches versus two pitches. Mm -hmm. And that's helped me out tremendously in camp. And I've shown great strides with that. So the three batter, I guess it can hurt some people. It, obviously, if you're a righty or lefty, you can only get righties or lefties out. Then, yes, it can hurt you very, um, very much. But um, for me, I get righties out just as good as lefties. And, you know, I, I don't see where it's going to be a problem with me moving forward. How'd you get the grip on your slider? Uh, I was actually watching uh, Mike Clevenger. I was um, on Instagram and uh, Robbie Rowe, I think it's his name. He's a big guy on Instagram. He breaks down pitching. And I follow him when I was watching a video and uh, Clevenger was talking about his slider and his curveball. And at the time I was, this past off season, I was trying to learn a grip. I tried every grip on the man. I could never find anything. So I was watching the video and I was like, well, Heck, he has really, really good stuff. I was like, I can try it out. It's off season, it's not gonna hurt me. <clears throat> so I ended up taking his curveball grip and made it into my slider grip and kind of the rest is history. We've had guys years ago learn pitches on YouTube. You just told me you learned to pitch on Instagram. Pretty much. Okay, it's, this is a new milestone right now. Yeah. This is the age we live in. It is, <laughs> it's it's crazy. Um, just seeing a little, little video helped me tremendously, you know. It was a, I don't even know how long the clip was, but it was just him breaking down his slider and curveball grip and all on Instagram. That is awesome, that yeah. is fantastic. My last question for you, and now you're here and now you are a mm -hmm. baseball player. What What is your favorite part of the baseball day? Hmm, favorite part of the baseball day? Definitely not conditioning. Um, nah, um, I don't know, that's, that's, that's tough. Um, I'll say being around all these guys, you know, it's uh, it's fun being around older guys, younger guys, um, and just kind of picking their brains, seeing how you know Seager carries himself, seeing how D carries himself, seeing all those older guys carry themselves, um, and the way they handle their business on and off the field, kind of taking bits and pieces from those guys. Um, but I would say the best part of the day is you know waking up knowing that. I'm playing baseball for a living, um, and I can I enjoy that. That's probably the best of it. So, and just being around all these dudes, it's they're great guys. Um, it's fun. Um, never never a dull moment in the clubhouse with all these dudes because we're so young. <laughs> um, we kind of take everything with a grain of salt, you know. And it's fun hanging out with all these good ball players and learning things from people that you didn't think you could learn something from. So that's kind of my best part of the day every day, playing baseball for a living and being around professional athletes every day, all day. Perfect. Taylor, thanks for letting us know a little Thank bit you. more about Thank you. I appreciate it.